And it digs into things like, you know, what is the culture of the organization? Do you prefer mentorship or do you prefer something that's a little bit more laid back? Is it important that you find an organization that is uh, supportive of, of you know, family life or that is you know, going to, to kind of make you grind for 12 hours a day? Like, what are you looking for as an individual? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EdTech Podcast. In this series episode of the VocTech Podcast, Learning Continued, which seeks to explore the intersection of adult learning and tech. My name is Sophie Bailey, and you are very welcome. And you can follow online at hashtag VocTech Podcast and at Podcast EdTech and at UFI Trust on Twitter. A big shout out to UFI VocTech Trust and UFI Ventures for supporting this new series and vocational skills development in the UK through their investments and grants in vocational technology. The UFI VocTech Seed Fund is open from the 21st of January to the 13th of February 2020. So what do you need to know? Well, there is between 15 and £50,000 available for innovative projects that use digital tech to help people improve the skills they need for work across the UK. The project duration can be anywhere from 3 to 12 months and there are supporting workshops and webinars to guide your applications happening now. And finally, applications for the seed grants are open on the 21st of January, as I mentioned, and close on the 13th of February at 5pm, so get prepping. For all the details, go to ufi.co.uk, ufi-seed-guidelines. So, what do we have in store for you on this week's episode? This week, I'm in conversation with David Shaw, head of Handshake UK and Europe. Handshake worked to make the student employability space, or bridge to work, better. They've recently set up in the UK and since this was recorded, they have added the indefatigable Natalie Nazati of EdTech Mark to their team as the head of UK marketing. In this recording from earlier in the year, David and I chat about starting Handshake, the pain points for employers aiming to recruit students and creating more opportunity for students no matter where they are located. Also this week, some snippets from Ian Hurd, who was out and about at the recent UFI VocTech showcase chatting to grant projects, including Mega Nexus, who work in rehabilitation ICT for justice, healthcare and employability, Nissan car manufacturers, who are working with their Sunderland-based Nissan apprentices, temporary manufacturing staff and placement students to use digital to better onboard new employees, and Pembrokeshire College, who have developed an on-the-go learning app to better support their vocational learning students. Don't forget, for all the show notes, it's the edtechpodcast.com. Okay, here we go. I'm really thrilled that David and I have finally got our timings aligned and we're both here today to talk on the EdTech podcast. And so I'm here with David Shaw, head of Handshake UK and Europe, and just a little bit of background. So on the Handshake website, it says your mission is to democratise early talent recruitment, working between students, universities and employers to help all students find meaningful careers. Handshake was set up in 2014 with a road trip across the States And last year, the company raised an additional 40 million US dollars to continue to grow and further democratize opportunity led by EQT Ventures here in Europe, along with social impact investors such as the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Amidiar Network and Reach Capital. Last year in 2018, if I've got this correct, you also moved to London to set up the European venture of Handshake, moving from burritos, I'm imagining, in San Francisco's Mission District to Flat Whites, possibly in Hackney. Handshake is described as one of the fastest growing edtech companies in the world, working with a community of 700 colleges and universities, 14 million students and young alumni, and 300,000 employers including 100% of the Fortune 500. So that sounds like quite the journey, David. To kick off, perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what the early days were like at Handshake. Yeah, well, I appreciate that uh, that awesome introduction. And it has certainly been a uh, pretty exciting couple of years here 
Uh, I joined Handshake in 2014 when we were still at a house in Houghton, Michigan, which I'm sure most of your listeners will not be familiar with. It is quite literally in the, the middle of nowhere in the center of the United States in a remote area of northern Michigan. If you wanted to visit it, it's about a flight into the Detroit airport. You could hire a car, drive about 11 hours north, and you finally arrive there. Okay. And, and so it was quite humble beginnings. And it came out of this kind of experience that we had as students that uh, of engaging with our university employability office and the experience and impact that they were able to have on our life. But at the same time, we realized that they were quite kind of te- technically constrained with the technologies that they had access to. And so we got things started to, to try and make an impact and to try and kind of make it more efficient for employers and universities and students to connect uh, through modern technology. Uh, that that's kind of the the summary now. But back then in 2014, we were working from uh, quite literally a kitchen in a house, just trying to build some software for our university career center. So it's pretty humbling to think back to, to those days and the fact that now just you know four to five years later, we have uh, 75% of the top 500 universities in the US and are kind of now on a pretty exciting path to expanding globally. I noticed also that you've uh, previously had jobs in events and audio and I used to work as an event director and obviously now work sort of as a podcaster so the audio connection and I can sort of see with the event role that that work would set you up nicely for a company which is all about connecting various stakeholders so I just wondered sort of reflecting on your past or your previous jobs how they've informed how you go about your work today. Kind of funny how those part-time jobs that you have in high school leading up to university or or even at university can really come in handy when you're starting a company, when you're, we're kind of in your, you're developing your career. Uh, Like you said, I, I, in high school was an audio producer for a baseball stadium near my local hometown, managing kind of the events and logistics and and audio associated with, with that production. Uh, It was a passion of mine. It was very much a hobby, but it's, you know, now coming in handy, having that experience managing events uh, managing kind of the the attendees and the kind of production quality and being able to to lean in on those areas is something I use quite frequently. We we just hosted last week a series of events that uh, that I was coordinating, and I borrowed from the skills at, at that position that I had in high school, but also when I was working in my university student activities office, actually planning these types of events, uh, all things that I did you know to make a little money on the side and and because it was something I was passionate about, but never would have dreamed that as I kind of pursued my passion for entrepreneurship and making an impact that all those skills would be be coming back in. And I think for me, it's just kind of a a pretty powerful testament on how you all these different work experiences, regardless of how trivial they seem, we we talk to students all the time. And we say, Mm -hmm. you know, we work with career advisors who are coaching students all the time that like these skills and experiences that you're developing matter. And you might not know that, that they are going to come in handy someday, but chances are that they, they will. And being able to kind of think and reflect on that is a pretty powerful tool. And that's something that I'm able to do today because I've thought about it a lot more. But when I was graduating from university, never would have been able to articulate that. But mm-hmm. it's, it's neat to kind of think back on it now. No, definitely. I mean, I think that's going to be one of our questions throughout this series is, you know, what bizarre and unique jobs each of our guests have had, because there's the kind of professional ones that you, you know, you you put on LinkedIn and there's all those other jobs that you've just sort of scrapped about doing as you're growing up and stuff. They give you a great repertoire of stories as well, I'm sure. Yes. Okay. So, you know, you've moved from the US and I'm imagining you, you kind of had a, a great exposure to the ed tech system and ecosystem over there. How have you found the main differences between, you know, where you were working in the US in terms of educational and ed tech systems and ecosystems and then what you're finding in London? I think that there's certainly some really interesting differences that, that we've picked up on when you're specifically thinking about kind of the employability space, I think that the UK government's emphasis on outcomes, on tracking that and measuring that has created kind of a series of incentives that really drive a focus of employability on, you know, inside of UK universities that we don't see in the States. Mm. Uh, There's no central measurements of outcomes in the the US. And it's kind of up to each university to decide how they want to measure it, how they want to publicize that information which drives some pretty major variations in the university's prioritization of employability and in outcomes. So it's been neat to, to kind of be able to now come in and start to participate at a much more federal level on what are universities' responsibilities when it comes to outcomes uh, and how does the government actually think about incentivizing that. That's been quite different. 
Uh, and I think more broadly, the emphasis on ed tech is really interesting. We were at an event, uh, actually, when we, we first connected, that the JISC events talking about how can the government and, and JISC and these other players make it easier for universities to procure startups to, to think more thoughtfully around kind of an ed tech strategy is something that we've we've never seen the U.S. government talk about or, or put an emphasis on. And some of that, I think, is the scale and the decentralization of that. But that has been really interesting to, to learn about and to be able to start to participate in here as well. Hmm. Um, so I think those are some of the, the big differences. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of nuance that goes into to each of those, and, and there's a lot of other differences as well. But those are probably some of the, the macro trends that we're seeing. And whereabouts is the sort of handshake HQ in London? So right now, we're still actually in the process of kind of building out the team. So mm-hmm. we're, we're looking for a good co-working space right now, but have been working a little bit from kind of remotely, working a little bit uh, from co-working spaces and, and things like that. Okay. Well, you mentioned earlier about the role of technology in Handshake and sort of more efficiently bringing together those various stakeholders and, you know, ultimately allowing students to have better access to what opportunities are out there. I just wondered if you could kind of explain a little bit about what that process is, because what I'm imagining is, you know, I always think it's quite bizarre that you go through this sort of uh, quite an experience of gravitas in terms of university learning, and then you get to the end of it, and there are sort of just some stool holders a bit like it's a sort of car boot sale or something, but with usually with like the the big four consultancies, maybe a handful of banks. And, you know, there are so many more interesting jobs that are just not represented there. So how yeah. did you go about like thinking about how to get all of the opportunities that are out there into what you're developing and, and sort of really broaden that out in a, in a, in a proper manner? Yeah, I, I think you know maybe maybe sharing a little bit of kind of what the ecosystem looked like before Handshake and and kind of looks like at universities that that aren't in the system to help illustrate some of the challenges that that you just described. So you know, my my alma mater, Michigan Tech, uh, when and what we experienced as students was that we did not have access to the same opportunities that a lot of our friends did that went to uh, maybe more prestigious institutions, even in the same kind of geographic area, but had a better brand name. And as we started to, to dig into that and talk to companies and talk to the University Career Center, what we, we kind of unearthed was this incredibly inefficient process for connecting with talent and for students to discover the variety of different career options that they have available to them. So if you're a company and you wanted to connect with 10 different universities, it used to be that you had to have the kind of forethought to think of those 10 universities. Generally, right there, the 10 universities that people think of are the 10 universities with the strongest brand. Then you have to go to their employability sites. You have to figure out what they call their custom branded jobs board. You have to create a separate username, a separate password. Uh, you paste in a position and a system if, if it supports copy and pasting, which wasn't even a given. And then you just kind of hope that the right students find that position. And that was not only a huge barrier of entry from a time perspective, that it, it almost immediately weeded out kind of startups, SMEs, mm. nonprofits, like they don't have time to spend hours and hours and hours navigating these processes. And so it immediately created a bias towards those larger companies. But even those larger companies, they don't have time to be able to, to go through that. So it created a culture of, you know, you pick your 10 universities, and that's where you post to. And if you don't happen to go to one of those 10 universities, then you're kind of just out of luck. And it created massive inefficiencies. And it was bad for everybody. Like universities were frustrated that they couldn't show and connect their students to these amazing opportunities that they knew existed. Employers were frustrated because they couldn't meet their hiring goals, whatever they might be, because of these inefficiencies. And students were, were ultimately losing out because they weren't necessarily finding the opportunities that were best fit for them. And we're oftentimes leaving university feeling like the university wasn't actually helpful in, in my career and what I wanted to do. And so Handshake comes in and and we basically reinvent that process through a network. Now, as an employer, you can manage your relationship with what is over 800 universities from a single platform for free. You can connect to those universities, you can share your jobs or vacancies, and you can actually start to move away from this like post a position and hope that the right student applies and actually start to be more proactive with that. Searching for students based on their profiles, based on their skills, based on work experience. So you could find that event planner um, and connect them to that opportunity proactively. I was talking with somebody yesterday you know, studying uh, that, that actually did recruitment for an IT firm. And she said, you know, we actually would love to connect with more uh, modern language students because mm. the, the skills that they develop as a part of that 
curriculum actually lend themselves perfectly to being in the more technical computer science fields. It's the same part of their brain. We can train them what we need to know there. But those students looked at an IT consultancy and said, there's no way that they would ever have jobs for me. Uh, They never visited them at a career fair. They didn't apply to those jobs. And if the student knew about those opportunities, they probably would be amazing. Like some of them would find that to be really exciting. The employer would be able to love, to, you know, love to connect with that talent. But today, the marketplace is so inefficient that there's no good way for them to connect. And Handshake tries to change that calculus by connecting them in a variety of different ways and providing modern technology for career centers in the process. For the student, you know, they they get access to a much broader field of universities as well. Uh, employers, exactly. sorry. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think that you know, the, the natural question there is more isn't necessarily better if you don't have the tools to be able to discover what's right for you. Mm-hmm. And so that's where you have, you know, kind of what is like, you know, standard, right? In today's modern technology, we have the kind of machine learning recommendation engines, but we've also introduced like peer to peer learning so that you can actually start to see what are other students like you saying about their experience working at these organizations or mm-hmm. being able to connect with questions that you may have with peers or alumni who've actually already gone and done that, that can come back and help invest in you. So we think a lot about not just democratizing the access to the opportunity, but how do we help democratize access to social capital and, and actually start to truly level the playing field when it comes to students navigating this kind of bridge to, to work process. And the natural evolution from that, I mean, will you continue, do you think the opportunity is still so great just to focus on, you know, that better matching process? Or do you see that Handshake would evolve into actually supporting some of the sort of learning for that new employee in the workplace and actually, you know, assisting them once they've got into that role? Yeah, it's something that that we think a lot about. And obviously, for for any you know, relatively early stage company, focus is everything. And mm-hmm. we make sure that we're doing a great job at what, what we've kind of set out to do and then start to think more broadly. So for us, that means making sure that we've really gotten down the, the kind of goals that we have around helping you know, students and, and maybe early alumni with that that kind of university to career transition. But I think we we do have a lot of conversations around once you've helped somebody maybe find their first job, how do you actually help build your social capital? And and what we find is that a lot of the problems that students have when they're looking for their second position or they're trying to develop in that career or they're looking for that promotion, the challenges that they're facing then aren't that different than what they go through when they're trying to find their first position. And so we think that if we can actually start to partner with that university, many of whom are under increased pressure to continue to engage alumni in a non-financial way, and we can actually start to help connect them to these students or these alumni who are trying to develop in their career in an ecosystem that addresses those same challenges. There's real potential to make a difference, not just for the first job, but as they think about building a meaningful career. I mean, and that's that's an interesting one as well. So on the on the other end of, of the spectrum where students are, you know, coming into employment, at the moment, if I understand correctly, you're primarily focused on universities, but certainly here in the UK, as I'm sure you're more than aware like there's a sort of broadening or general discussion around how do we you know make those pathways to employment more diverse so perhaps you know apprenticeship degrees or further education colleges or a mix or universities that are more aligned with um, project-based learning with employers um, whilst you're also doing your degree um, so do you see that you will be sort of broadening the spectrum of who you connect with to help onboard students into employment as well? Absolutely. And this is actually something that that's you know, quite topical for us right now mm. uh, in the, the U.S. and, and soon will be uh, probably across the U.K. as well. We're, we're opening up Handshake to even more students. So it used to be that in order to access Handshake, you had to be at a university that was partnered with us to provide basically the employability operations on that campus. And while we still hope and and our goal is to be able to partner with every university and, and every career service on the university, we also recognize that one, not every student is fortunate enough to be able to go to a university. Two, not every university has a budget or the resourcing to be able to kind of procure a system like Handshake. And so in order to accomplish our mission, we, we need to now start to think a little bit more broadly around how can we continue to invest in those deep university relationships, but still allow students who maybe aren't connected to those resources to be able to, to you know, have access to opportunity to build social capital, uh, to access information that's critical in making career-related decisions. So 
we're, we're actually in the, the early phases of opening up Handshake. The first phase will be for any kind of student that has a .edu email address or .ac.uk email address. They'll be able to come in. They will have access to the same functionality as a student who's at a university where they could you know, schedule appointments. They can start to, to connect with their career services in a variety of different ways, but they will be able to access positions that employers have decided to make available to them to access some of the kind of Q&A and reviews left by their peers and other students mm. across the, the country and really start to, to kind of engage. So it's very early days there, but it is something that as we think about our mission to, to truly democratize opportunities so that everyone can have access to the building blocks of a meaningful career, it does need to go beyond your kind of traditional four-year institution that has the resourcing to procure a system like Handshake for their, their students. And I think it's really interesting what you said about the sort of almost glass door functionality of existing student alumni who are now in, in employment who are able to sort of say, look, this is what my progression opportunities are like here. This is what the culture's like here. I'm imagining you mostly connect with perhaps like the HR director, but also from like the learning and development specialist within an employer. Could they connect with companies like Handshake to essentially then help better understand what their own employees sort of aspirations are and then kind of work in this triangulated way to help develop that employee to to kind of progress and perhaps it's to access the right learning and development resources within their organization. But I think there's so much competition now almost among whether it's Gen Z or, you know, other employee bases and demographics, but to find the right fit and, you know, sort of working independently as a freelancer or in the gig economy is growing. So, you know, there's yep. got to be some reason why students then choose to to kind of continue in employment after perhaps they've picked up a base le- level of skills. Yeah, and I think that when you talk to kind of talent leaders at, at companies through this concept of retention is is very top of mind, right? How do we keep these, how do we keep employees and talent and avoid having to just constantly be retraining? Uh, you know, it's it's an area that we, we think that eventually we'll be able to, to, you know, make an impact on. And, you know, right now our, our focus is more on like if we can help connect the right, you know, kind of student or early career professional to the right organization, our hypothesis is that retention long term will probably be better. Uh, I think where you see a lot of turnover is somebody who comes in, they put up with a position for a year or two because they're trying to develop the skills, knowing that they're going to move on and, and they won't have to kind of maybe put up with what isn't a great fit. And so when a student actually comes in, some of the most popular things, we, we have put them through an onboarding experience to help kind of tailor their experience through the system before. And we ask them kind of the standard things like, you know, are, are there particular industries or sectors you're interested in, particular functions that are interesting to you? But I think what really resonates with students is we ask them, you know, what are the, the attributes of a company that are important to you? And it digs into things like, you know, what is the culture of the organization? Do you prefer mentorship or do you prefer something that's a little bit more laid back? Is it important that you find an organization that is uh, supportive of, of you know, family life or that is you know, going to, to kind of make you grind for 12 hours a day? Like, what are you looking for as an individual? We're able then to use the review data that we generate from other students. Companies can't kind of self-select this. It has to be selected by other students on those exact same attributes to drive more meaningful recommendations and you're mm. able to get through some of these uh, these kind of more you know important but but maybe like a little bit more superficial things like you know what sectors are you interested in and so I think that's just one example of where we want to continue to move long term is if we can get the the right student in the right role and we can make this kind of talent economy far more efficient it will be better for everybody long term. And what's the split of your student user base in terms of sort of more undergrads versus perhaps more mature students who've gone back to university to sort of reskill and then go back into the the workforce? Yeah, so I, I, right now, as you'd imagine, I think that most of the probably our user base is certainly skewed more towards your kind of traditional undergraduate uh, graduate students. We do have quite a few universities uh, who have strong populations of you know adult learners, people who are going back to, to reskill. And it's an area that we we think a lot about is how do we make sure that we are truly designing handshake for everybody? 
Uh, in our office back in San Francisco, we have kind of personas of all these different students that, that go beyond, right, just the mold of you know, your typical three or four year undergraduate students mm-hmm. uh, that's come right from, you know, kind of a, a you know, high school or primary school education. And we are, it's a constant reminder of the fact that like, we need to be building this for everybody. And that means the recommendation engines need to think about like, where are you at in your career? The questions that we ask need to be inclusive of, you know, not just different cultures and nationalities and backgrounds, but also different stages in life and what people are looking for. And admittedly, it's something that like, as we focus, like it's something that we, we expect to become even more of a you know, population that, that Handshake is serving uh, over the, the next few years as we open this up, as we engage with other organizations outside of kind of your typical three or four year university. And your work uh, leading in the UK and Europe, um, on the one hand, that will be connecting with universities. And on the other, I'm guessing uh, more the employers. So I just wondered if um, how you're going about uh, connecting with some of those employers, because uh, from a purely selfish point of view, I, I'd probably like to interview some of those as well in terms of how they are thinking about workplace learning um, and using yep. technology to help keep their uh, employees engaged and you know upskilled and, and all of the rest of it. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly right. So I think one of the, the neat things about the Handshake Network, you know, we have right now roughly 425,000 global organizations that are recruiting on Handshake. Uh, we haven't actually launched any universities here in the UK, but we have about 75% of the FTSE 100 already using the system. And so it's it's neat to see that this scale has happened really organically. That's all been done with actually no uh, marketing on our side. But it, it's helpful as we think about expanding to this new you know, country and, and new continents as we, we have conversations with companies, with heads of talent that are overseeing recruitment here. We're able to get feedback and, and kind of affirmation that the type of network that we're proposing would be game changing for them. So I've talked with heads of talent at large tech companies that have already committed to starting to source talents, large banks that have already committed to using this at any university that launches the system mm-hmm. because they can see how much more efficient it makes the whole process and, and how, how they will be able to start to recruit more diverse uh, you know, employee populations. They'll be able to start to take a little bit more ownership over that process than they're able to do today and really start to, to change the calculus. So to be honest, most of my time is focused on working with universities. And, and I think there's some complexities around like making sure that the product's a good fit there. Because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the employer network is is actually driven fairly organically based on the partnerships that already yeah. happen, have we already have and, and based on the universities that launch the system. Got you. I read that you love audiobooks, So I <laughs> thought you should sa- share some of your favorite audiobooks with our listeners. <laughs> yes. So I, uh, I'm definitely, anytime I'm on a commute or, or kind of on the, the, the tube or whatever it might be, I've got an audio book in, you know, I think my all time favorite, uh, is, is how to win friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. I was put off by the, the title for, for a long time, but I finally listened to it after several people recommended it, uh, and just love the basic lessons that it had. It's, it's, it's nothing kind of earth shattering, but such a good reminder of, of just, you know, uh, what's important and, and what resonates and, and helps drive connections. Uh, I like to listen to a lot of kind of like startup related books. Uh, one of the ones that I really liked recently is Bad Blood, talking about the the story or kind of rise and fall of Theranos and Silicon mm, Valley. And I really the want to listen to there. the podcast about that. I'm, I'm fascinated by that story. <laughs> it is so interesting. And it was funny because you know, when they were in kind of their heyday, I remember driving by their office because it was right when Handshake <laughs> had moved to Silicon Valley. And uh, it's just a crazy story. So a little bit of everything, uh, a lot of biographies. And I think my most kind of education related uh, book this, this year has been educated a memoir by Tara mm. Weston talking about her journey going from kind of a radical Mormon, uh, upbringing in, in kind of rural, I think it was Idaho mm-hmm. into now a, uh, a kind of doctoral student at Cambridge and, and everything that kind of went a part of that. So Definitely, yeah. definitely uh, one of my, my favorite hobbies. I, I heard her on another podcast and yeah, it's totally fascinating about how much of our sort of belief system and everything that we think is completely normal and um, assumed is is totally socially constructed. And yeah, I kind of felt for her uh, as she was sort of traversing what we all consider like fairly average life. But yeah, really fascinating story. 
It, it really is. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your chat with us. And if people want to connect with you and find out more about what you're up to, what's the best way for them to go about that? Yeah, probably just drop me an email. Uh, it's just david at joinhandshake.com and would love to, to connect. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, David. Thank you. Appreciate you having me on. Okay, so I've just arrived and I'm just speaking to Richard West at Mega Nexus, who's been telling me all about how you're bringing education not just into prisons, but into people's cells. This is really massive. So I wanted to talk to you about this again. So if you could just explain to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. So the, the whole ethos behind it is to uh, increase the learning provision within a prison from the standard classroom, which allows prisoners to access resources such as job training, vocational training, and edu- uh, educational courses from probably one to two hours a week right up to 161 hours a week, which gives wow. them a massive, massive, much more... Uh, chance of actually being rehabilitated when they leave prison Um, and the way to do this is actually to access the resources such as job training, um, vocational courses actually within the cell Um, sounds like a really really easy simple solution we just give them a a laptop to do it but we are talking about pretty much the securest environment in Europe (laughs) which makes it a little bit more difficult a bit tricksy but, a little bit more difficult. But yeah. I really love this because so, this idea of, you know, of the motivational aspect of it as well, like having this at your fingertips, being able to personalize that learning in someone's cell without them having to kind of like, you know, do the walk of shame as it might be for them to, you know, some place within a, a prison to get that learning. It's so it, it does eliminate that peer pressure of yeah. um, you're, you're, you're in prison, so you're, you can't learn. Um, and we've been working with prisons for more than 10 years, and we understand that for the vast majority of prisoners, they want to rehabilitate. They want to sure. make better lives themselves. They want to get a job. They want to get a house. Yeah. They want to learn stuff, but they just don't know how. Yeah. And they've not given the opportunities to do that. That's well, amazing this actually that you're giving them that, that. support. That's, we actually, that's really this actually good. solves that problem. Yeah. Um, we know that the cost of reoffending in the UK, for example, is currently st- uh, the latest uh, Ministry of Justice figures as £15 billion pound a year which is a staggering amount. So if we can get 10% of those guys, we save the UK 1.5 billion. That, Hopefully, wow. that's our goal. That's a pretty big goal. Thank you so much, Richard, for talking no to problem. me. Sorry we can't cool. talk longer. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Kyle, yes. lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you too. I was just listening in, just eavesdropping, about the Nissan Digital Space for Empowering Young Adults to Own Their Own Development and Career Progress. I love okay. this kind of thing. Maybe you can tell me a little bit more about how this all works and what who it's for. Yeah, so this app, um, as you heard me say, it's predominantly aimed at our apprentices, yeah. um, but it comes in, in two stages. So it's the initial onboarding of the apprentice. So what we found is um, the onboard and induction process can be quite boring, if I'm honest. Yep. So a lot of the first kind of day or so is a lot of form filling and you're kind of rewriting the same information. Um, so we get rid of that through the app. So a successful candidate is sent a link um, prior to starting and they can do all of that form filling in their own time before they start with us. And it's very user-friendly and we can go to the app and approve it from an admin point of view. We approve that and that's done. And it can be logged digitally. So it kind of saves us a bit of time and it, it gives the apprentice a a better experience, a better kind of experience. Yeah. And then once they're fully onboarded and they're enrolled into their scheme, they continue to engage with the app through um, learning and development resources. So there's an abundance of material through the app which can kind of support and supplements the training and they'll be provided throughout their apprenticeship, um, either through Nissan or through their local college who, where they'll attend throughout yeah. their scheme. Um, we can track each individual apprentice to see what they're engaging with or what they're not engaging with. So it's all content that you provide, not not that the college provides that you're... It's all, it's all it's Nissan content. Um, a lot of it is health and safety based, so there's a bit of a push around health and safety to plant at the minute, and we kind of grasp that and incorporate it into the app. And um, There's a lot of interactive material, a lot of videos, uh, which they can use to enhance their understanding of each learner's engagement. We can kind of set them little questions or quizzes to ensure that they haven't just opened a video and have left it to run while they're watching TV. So sure. they, they need to understand... They need to demonstrate understanding of what they've read or what they've watched. So you are you aligning that up with like a blended learning program where they can actually then apply that knowledge? Precisely. All of the content on here is it's day-to-day stuff which they're required to adhere to. And that's on top of what they're doing at college? Yeah. So I was reading, was it... 
on average takes like 28 weeks okay. to get someone from being onboarded to being at their optimum level okay. of operation, yeah, mm-hmm. so of efficiency in their productivity in their yeah. job. So, yeah, an average of 28 weeks, which costs a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So you're trialing that next year when the apprenticeships start. At the minute, it's purely a support function in addition to what they're already studying or doing at college or at yeah. work. But there is scope to embed a certified qualification. So you could complete your qualification through the app, but it, it will be certified. So, so at the minute, as I said, it's purely support function to enhance their knowledge and their experience yeah. um, but in the future it's a bit of a pipe dream at the minute we're, we're quite confident we can make it a reality that you could actually complete a certified qualification through this facility and uh, it's, it's little touches like this I think which, uh, yeah. which are really nice and, and as you say it gives them a bit of a responsibility a bit of ownership over their yeah. own future and their own development Yeah, yeah which yeah, we yeah. hope is going to have a positive impact exactly that agency is really important mm-hmm. for um, keeping people invested in where they're working yeah Especially these days when there's a big churn, isn't there? People yeah. don't stay longer than average, like two to three years, and they move on. But also, yeah, with, with my HR hat on, it, it gives us, um, and it makes our job easier to identify talent as well. Who's the most engaged? Exactly. Who's the most key? Who wants to develop? We can yeah. identify that quite easily through the app. Yeah, yeah. Or who to give the most support to if they're, if they're well, disengaging. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah you're, you're dead yeah. right. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks for having us. Yeah, good luck with it all. And, uh, yeah. Cheers, thank you. Are you with the Pembrokeshire College? Yes, that's right. Which, yeah. which uh, campus is that? It's in Haverford West, thanks, yeah. Haverford West, yeah, I think I've been there about a year and a half ago. There's, there's Sharon Lesher, Barry Walters, or Glyn Jones have been the last... Glyn Jones, that's the name I recognise. Oh, you know Glyn Jones, all right. Yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. Well, I, I'm a senior moderator for University Arts London Awarding Body. Oh, right, OK, right. And I yeah. visited there, I did the advisory visit for there uh, about a year and a half ago, so, right. yeah, so I was there then. You were, yeah, you're brilliant. They've transformed uh, what, how we deliver our art courses. Really? Well, because they yeah. they really embrace technology and they yeah. they embrace... It's made a real difference. Oh, well, that's nice to hear. Yeah. I advise on the creative media courses there. But so, yeah, it was... yeah, you'd have met Dennis Bassett-Jones. Yep, that's right, yeah, yeah. Because he's now using... The learners submit their websites. Yeah. And then he, he, he narrates his commentary yeah. while he's navigating the website. Yeah. And he uses that as feedback. Yeah, that was that was one of the things I advised them to do. Yeah. Oh, right, good gracious. In fact, <laughs> but, he presented up. He, he presented that idea to the principal last week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant! Well, I'll let him take credit for that. Then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Is this you, Cognify? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. This sounds right. interesting. Would you mind telling me a little bit more about it? Well, yeah. the, the idea came from um, our work-based learning manager. Yeah. Who wanted some way to get learners to do stuff when they weren't doing anything else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> When they were slacking, you mean? Well, or yes. Was home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they were home, yeah. But also, this is the generation that um, are used to voice assisted technology. You know, yep. they're used to asking, hey, Google, they're used to Siri. So the idea is is that you give the learners their work, but you give it yeah. so that it's actually narrated. Like, for instance, on the example I give you is molecular gastronomy to, to a hospitality students. They would listen to it, and then the, then the document stops and then switches to voice to text. Yeah. So it asks a question, and then the learners are obliged to answer, and then obviously... It's embedded, embedded question content. Yeah, so it's multiple yeah. choice or open questions. But the, what the benefit of that is, because as you just said, this is a podcast, is you can do it while you're doing something else. You haven't got to look at the screen. Yeah. You haven't got to look at the video. And that's got a lot of advantages. And we've just got Vogtech Impact funding to sort of take it to the next level. So we want to integrate it with virtual learning environments. So the teacher will set them some coursework, and then right. that, those, those will be automatically sent and stored against them in the, in the virtual learning environment. Yeah. It provides instant feedback. So, for instance, it's got multiple choice questions in it. And um, if you get the right answer, it'll tell you you're right and it'll provide some feedback. If you get it wrong, it'll provide some feedback. No, yeah. you've got that wrong. But it would be nice in the future to look at how we might use AI to... So we're standing right next to Ada. Yeah, yeah, yes, well, yeah, <laughs> I know yeah. Tab, yeah, right. so, yeah. Are you? Uh, is that is that kind of where, you were, where you're going with That's this? That's way down the line first. Right. I think we need to prove, prove this first and get right. it working as it is before we move any yeah. further forward. Got to show so, the impact. Yeah, yeah. How long has it been going for? Well, we had Voctech um, funding uh, a year to 18 months ago, but um, it's not yet at the stage where we, uh, what you would call a minimum viable product, you know. Right. We, there's no, there's no iOS version of it yet. Yeah. And we haven't got the authoring tool. But once we've got the authoring tool and iOS version, then we can go out 
and get teachers to build their own their own worksheets and okay. um, and test out for real with real learners you know so you know 90 percent of learners are either like the idea or like the idea a lot you know so we we know we're on to something yeah we just got to take it to that next level now so. they fed back to you what they like why they like it well they like the fact that I'll, I'll, I'll get, I'll get, I'll because they, they can do it without having to use their fingers on the keyboard Right. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Because I, well, I, personally, I think maybe the keyboard, the use of the keyboard is going to diminish, and uh, we will eventually just That's talk. It's quite to... limiting, isn't it? A keyboard it slows yeah. things down a lot as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And from an accessibility perspective, it's quite limiting for a lot well, of people. Well, if you look at if you look at a lot of the things that have been talked about tonight, yeah. they're about not using keyboards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. been a big push for that. I've, you know, been reading yeah. a lot, and yeah. it's great. We have, we we will actually we need to be able to talk to our computers. We must, be, you know, we already moving away from using a mouse aren't we yeah. we touch our screens we don't use a mouse it's interesting actually I was, the most recent Voctech podcast was talking about this actually talking about this idea of interfacing using natural language processing but it's interesting you know we do need to develop that space so that we can become a bit more fluid in the way that we utilise all of these you know digital tools and the capabilities that they provide us and allow us oh it's extraordinary I mean it's it really been extraordinary is. over the last 20 years isn't it? since yeah. the birth of the internet and the web it's been really extraordinary yeah. I mean, who would have thought that? You know, I was born in the 60s. Yeah. It? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, people have been talking about education technology, you know, in, a, in lots of um, yeah, yeah. hyperbole, <laughs> and, uh, you know, for a long time now. But it's actually, I think I really do feel like it's actually really starting to make a difference now. It's nice. We're, we're just getting there, I think. There has been a lot of hyperbole, but I think we are, you know, it's... Well, I think it takes organisations, leadership from places like UAL to pliable. Well, that's yeah. an interesting thing to take on, actually, in terms of how these technologies can then support learners in a lifelong context continuously. Well, I agree with you. Yeah, you know, like, um, I had to change the radiator the other day, and you just instantly go onto YouTube and find yeah. a video that tells you, you how to do, do it. You do a degree in it, do you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, just, you just get on with it. And, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Just get on with it. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Just that should be your slogan, shouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> just get on with it. Well, there was uh, there's a, a politician. I'm sure he says something like, "Get it done." <laughs> I wouldn't want to be <laughs> yeah. pigeonholed with the same politician. No, oh but, God, no. no, no. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to go around and speak some of you. Yeah. Lovely to meet you, Jeff. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, Good yeah. To see yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's all for this week's episode. Thanks to all the guests, to Ian, to UFI Voctech Trust, and to you all for listening. And don't forget, if you've got a good idea or existing work in supporting vocational skills development in the UK, the UFI Seeds Grant application process is open in January and workshops and webinars to help guide you are open now. Whatever you're up to this week, I hope you have a good one. I'm just back from Reimagine Education, where I recorded a live version of this series and hope to get that out to you before too long. That's all for now. Thanks for subscribing and listening. Bye bye.